take tea. Now this is going to be interesting because Jesus actually curses a tree today. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay, verse 18. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered and died. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? They asked. Well, let's figure out, what are fig trees? Fig trees are bright green and very large, growing up to one foot long. These are the leaves on it, the fig leaves themselves. They're this big, they're bright, they're green, they're very large. They can be a, a foot long, right? Um, Ron Daniel, who is a pastor that I listen to um, in the book of Matthew, he says the fruit of the spring crop, the breva crop, comes out on the last season's growth. So it actually bears fruit before the leaves come. So the reason why I use this quote is because Jesus sees this tree with these leaves, and the fruit is supposed to be there. So if the leaves are there, the, there's, there should be fruit there. So Jesus is hungry. He's walking. He sees what appears to be a, a tree with fruit, which is going to be breakfast, a meal for him. And with the leaves, he's like, okay, fruit, fruit's going to be here because there's leaves here. So he walks up. There are no leaves. That's why he gets mad at the tree and curses it, because it appeared to have fruit. It gave the perception that it had fruit. Because like a mask. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. The outside versus the inside. From the outside, they, the tree appeared to be fruitful, appeared to be alive, appeared to be pretty, appeared to, to have something that Jesus needed. But on the inside, what the reality is that it, it, it didn't. It, it put on a, a, a mask. It was fake. It was a fake. And this is, this is Jesus talks about wearing masks all the time in Scripture about putting on a front, like putting makeup on, making yourself look real cool around church people, you know, throwing everybody off. You come to church, do the Bible study in the service, you clap your hands when you're supposed to, you say amen, you raise your hand occasionally. You can put on a facade, but Jesus knows the heart. Jesus knows the heart. And so what he does with this tree, this tree looked like it was going to have fruit. Just like as believers, the Bible says we are supposed to bear fruit. We're supposed to produce fruit. Not actually oranges and apples, but what, what's going to happen is by the fruit we produce it is how people know that we're Christians. Is that like so, children? No, not, no. no. Like other believers. Yeah, so like, yeah, if, if people come to know the Lord because God has used you in an amazing way, that's fruit being produced. Um, or amazing God things happening because of your dedication and meditation and prayer, that's fruit being produced. Um, and so, yeah, exactly, Natasha, you're right. It's exactly a mask. Okay, so in Matthew 3, we read this, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children from Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit, every tree, that's people, that does not produce good fruit, will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So what this is saying is that there's people, so God gives us a mission to produce fruit. Those who don't, just like this fig tree that Jesus uh, killed, that's going to ha happen to us. We're going to be cut down, and we're going to be thrown into fire, i.e. hell. So, so Jesus, and this is Matthew 3, and we're now in 21. So this is something that he said over and over and over again. This time, he just actually acted it out by killing that tree. Genesis 3, 7 says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. These fig leaves, again, this is Adam and Eve, they sin, they try to cover themselves up, these fig leaves foot long, so they thought that was enough clothing. They were hiding from themselves. They were hiding just like a mask. They were, they were covering themselves up, trying to make them look presentable to God, but God knew that they had sinned. God knew that they had sinned. So, so again, the reiteration, you can't fake out God. Fake me out. Fake Miss Tony, fake Joe out, fake yourselves out. Can't fake me out. Or can't fake God out. You can fake me out. Cover up. Again, verse 21, Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, Go throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Prayer. That's, that's 
what it's all about. If you believe, you will receive. And so oftentimes, I, I've been talking to youth before, I talk to adults sometimes about prayer. And they're like, you know what? I can ask God for that, that's not gonna happen. And to them I say, you're right, it's not. Because of how you make that comment. You have this preconceived notion that God can't do things. You have this preconceived notion that what you're asking for is, is up here and, and God only works with minuscule things. But God's talking the biggest. He's saying mountains being moved here. So you have to believe. You have to have that faith to believe. Um, and then, like it says, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Jesus entered the temple courts, verse 23, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you this authority? So Jesus is teaching. These are priests. So these are religious leaders, right? They're going up to Jesus saying, Who gave you this authority? What do you have to be teaching right now? They ask him that. Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Verse 25. John's baptism. John the Baptist. John's baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? So Jesus is like, okay, you want the answer to your questions that you just asked me back here about what authority and who gave it to you? I'll give you that answer if you answer one question. John the Baptist, his ministry, his baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or was it human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? Because remember, John the Baptist come, he preaches righteousness, he says repent, he's baptizing people, and they didn't believe. He ends up getting beheaded, right? So they're saying, well, if we say heaven, um, they're going to say, why didn't we believe him? So they're, he'll be like, hey, if you knew it was heaven, why didn't you believe in him, right? So then, but verse 26 says, but if we say of human, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So John was a prophet, so it wasn't human origin. It had to be from heaven, but if they answer that, then all of a sudden Jesus is going to be like, why didn't you believe then? So it was like a, they were, it was a lose-lose for them. It was a catch-22. It was a lose-lose. So they answered, we don't know. <laughs> we, we don't know. Which is an easy answer to get out of, even though Jesus knows the answer, right? So they thought that was the best. They were speechless. Okay. He knew that they would reject it just as they had rejected the authority that God had given to John the Baptist. And that's why they said, I don't know. Jesus knew that they wouldn't submit to the authority. So just like John the Baptist comes, he's preaching righteousness, he's telling people to repent, they didn't accept him. They rejected him. He gets beheaded. Okay? He was a prophet, though. Jesus comes, and he's teaching, he says, at the very beginning when Jesus is on scene, he says the same thing. Repent, uh, and he was preaching righteousness. And what he's saying is, look, they're not going to submit to him. He knows that these same people are going to be the ones killing him. So he was kind of af asking a like foreseeing question. They didn't realize it, though. But he knew that they wouldn't submit to his authority. Like if he said God the Father, he knew that they weren't going to submit to that. Verse 28. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later, he changed his mind and went. So there, there's, a, there's a man, has two sons, says to one son, Go work. First guy says no, then he says okay, change his mind and goes. Verse 30. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing, but he answered, I will, sir. So one son says no, and then he's like, all right, I better do it. So he goes. He goes to the other son, and the other son says yes, but he doesn't go. Right? So which of the two did the father want it? Like, which one was the better? First. First one. First one. Yeah, that's exactly right. The first, they answer. Yeah, right there. Okay. <laughs> Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, i.e. what I just said, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe in him. So what Jesus is saying is, look, there are these people, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, they're like the worst of the worst, Reed. They are, they are the far off, worst of the worst, and they were accepting it over the religious people. So what he's saying is, look, they didn't believe they're going to heaven before you guys, right? So what he's saying here is the one who said no and lived in sin, but eventually turned from it, he repented, 
is what we're called to be like. Not the hypocrites, not the fakes, not the ones who would say they are going to do something and not. So this is a reflection of what we should be like, right? So God gives us a call. We're born into sin, so we reject it right away. As kids, we reject it right away. Growing up, you guys are rebellious, you reject it right away. Even if your first wounds are praise Jesus out of the womb, you come out, mom's holding you, your first words are praise Jesus, you're still a sinner, right? <laughs> you're still a sinner, okay? So we come out in this world sinful. We're sinful people, right? So we reject Jesus. Jesus gives us a call. Maybe when you're your age, maybe younger, maybe even a little older, you might hear the call. God might open your eyes, open your ears to what he's telling you. And immediately you might reject it, just like that one son. But then by the Holy Spirit, by the grace, by the mercy of God, he woos you, and then you go. And what, what this is saying is, that is much better than the person who says, yes, Lord, I'll do it, I'll live for your glory, I'll repent of my sins, I do, but then they don't. They don't, they just continue to live in sin. So it, 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 there's a firm understanding, and I know because I've been there, that we're messed up people. We are, we're screwed up, right? Something's wrong in this world. Boston Marathon is just one example. There, there are lost people in this world. We're sinful people, right? There's evil out there. So, so if you recognize that and you turn from it, praise be to God. But if you recognize that there's evil, you recognize you're sinful and you don't turn from it, that's, that's, that's the fig tree being thrown into the fire right there. Verse 33, another story. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent a service to the tenants to collect his fruit. So what happens, he builds this nice vineyard, has some farmers take over, he leaves, then all of a sudden harvest time, so he sends people back to get, to get the good harvest, right? Third, 35. The tenants seized his servants, so these people come to get fruit, the, the, the same owner sends his servants, they seize them, beat one, kill another, and stone a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time. Tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They, were, they will respect my son, he said. So what's happening here is this landowner of this vineyard, he builds this vineyard, has a watchtower, has a wall around it. It's legit, okay? It's legit. He moves away, okay? All of a sudden, it's harvest time. He's like, oh. Here, I'm going to send three servants. You guys go collect some harvest, bring back to us. They go, they, they kill them. All of a sudden, he's like, okay, I'm going to send more this time. They kill them too. Now he's saying, okay, I'm going to send my son. Because I'm the owner, they understand that. They'll respect my son. They'll respect him. It's my son. 38. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him. Take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. <laughs> so this landowner thought they were going to respect the son. They were going to actually submit to authority. Just maybe foreshadowing Jesus. Okay, submit to the authority. But what happens is they kill him. Because, here's why. They kill him because they're after the inheritance. They thought by killing the son, Reed. They thought by killing the son. Here, Reed, sit up here. Again. Just come up here. Just come up here. It's okay. Would you shut hey, easy. You guys knock it off. Just sit up here. No, you won't. It's okay. Just sit up here. I like it back there. It's I, warm. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So, so they kill the son because they're after the inheritance. They thought, hey, if we kill the son, we understand that his father owns all this. He's able to move away. We could get some of that, that money, right? Verse 40. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? So this is Jesus asking. What, what's the, and so they said, He will bring those wretcheds to the wretched inn, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. So what Jesus is saying is, look, okay, guys. So you guys just heard that story. What then will the owner do when he gets to those people that killed those people, killed his son? What will he do to them? And they even say, oh, they'll bring them to a wretched end. They'll bring them to what they deserve, which right answer. And so he's saying, 
and then they'll also rent it out to other people who will who will give out that good crop. So this is a foreshadowing of what happens to Jesus, right? Jesus comes, people are killed, John the Baptist is killed before Jesus, just like one of these servants that went back. All of a sudden the sun comes, people kill the sun, people kill Jesus, right? Then all of a sudden these people are like, okay, God, what, what do those people deserve? And they even admit they deserve a wretched end. Like they're self-proclaiming, that's what those evil people do, right? First, um, and they're saying, okay, and then it will be given to people who will actually give out the harvest, i.e. true followers of Jesus. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders reject has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous to our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. So what Jesus is saying is, look, there are people that, that are in control, that have this land, just like what, he, what happened here with uh, the tenants. They have it, and if they use it for not, for not God's glory, for their own glory, thinking, oh, earthly riches, they're going to die. They're going to come to a wretched end. They're going to be crushed. They're going to be crushed. But... The kingdom of God will be taken away from them and given to the people who produce its fruit. Again, not apples and oranges, but fruit. Kingdom advancing things. God amazing things for the kingdom. 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew that he was talking about them. So these priests, these religious people, they knew that he, was, he, made, he got these parables referencing them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. The vineyard, again, symbolizes Israel. Israel belongs to God, and so if you substitute Israel in for the vineyard about people taking care of it but not doing it in a godly may, godly way, those people will get thrown into the fire. It's going to be given to God's chosen people who are going to produce fruit. So first they reject it in the first parable, of the vineyard, they rejected God the Father, right? The second parable of the of the uh, vineyard, they reject the Son. The Son comes. The third, who are they going to reject? The owner. Owner, maybe. What's it representing? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But that's next time. Oh, you have to come back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to you have to come back Wednesday night. Now let me get a drink of water because then we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna wrap up verse twenty one today. Today we're gonna wrap it up. Don't tell like my teacher, please. My teacher is taking away from our teacher. Yeah. Wait, where's my shirt, Jake? Yeah. Yeah. Those are sure when you're finished. Like when do you get your <laughs> tomorrow? I'll cut it off for you today. Tomorrow? <laughs> do I have the cast on my arm? <laughs> Is it Angel's sure first hour? No. Angel's first hour? When was that? Tomorrow? I get to take okay. off at 9 o'clock. Does, does anybody oh. have any questions, comments no. about what we just read? No. No? No? Good job. No, you're uh, no, right. Amen, brother. Right now. Not as of right now. Does everybody understand that when it comes to fruit, when it that I mean that's what we're supposed to produce? Like does everybody can everybody wrap their mind around what that exactly means? Like as Christians, do do people know so I'm not I'm not assuming everybody in here is, is following following Jesus. I can't assume that. But let's say we are. So if we're all following Jesus, if we look at our life, if we just kind of reflect and meditate real quick on, on our life, can, can you guys see, and this, this isn't an out loud answer, can you guys see any good fruit coming from your lives? So I know you're young. I know you're not in a position uh, maybe to, to reach coworkers. Um, or you can't drive necessarily places to do like feeding the homeless and do a God things like that. But just at your school, do you guys see, and this is, again, just asking yourself this question, do you guys see any fruit being produced? Do you guys see that at all? 
see that at all? Like, do you, do you see do you, do you see that the fig leaf or the fig tree or maybe are you Jesus sees you and you appear to have these leaves and you appear to have these this fruit that Jesus expects you to have because you have the leaves. So you put on the look, you look like it. So Jesus sees that and he and he goes to you wanting to see your fruit, wanting to see your what you've produced. He he goes to you and is he disappointed? Is he upset? Is he willing to curse you the reference that you'd be thrown in a fire? So, so this is this is something beyond Crittenden Baptist, beyond Crittenden community as a whole, Grant County, Kentucky, United States. This is a outside looking in. What what are we doing here? We're living for Jesus. We need to turn from our sins. But Jesus gives us this illustration of the fig tree in just a couple verses. Then he goes into about the vineyard. But this fig tree symbolizes us. Us. Depending on if you maybe are just put it on a facade. Just put it on your facade. Because if you're a fig tree with those leaves and half fruit, Jesus is going to be satisfied. Because he's hungry. He's going to be satisfied. He'll be able to take that fruit and nourish himself with it and be fine. So the, the overall question is are you producing fruit or not if you are praise be to god and this is only if you're a christian i mean you try to walk up to an atheist and say are you producing fruit they're gonna be like what are you talking about you know this is for this is for believers this is for people who claim to know jesus who want to live for jesus this is for people who have repented meaning turning from your sin you hate sin you hate things that make God upset. You hate those things. You want to do those things, but we still do. But we just ask for repentance um, because we know He will forgive, thanks to the cross. And so, what you need to ask yourself is just evaluate, evaluate. Just kind of, do you have the fruit? Do you have the? If, if Jesus were to walk in this room right now, and and we're all these big trees, okay? And he would walk up to you, and he'd be able to look in your eyes, and that would go to your soul, and it would reveal to him, even though he knows this already, it would reveal to him everything in your life, if you produce fruit or not. Will he be satisfied, or will he be disappointed? That's what you have to ask yourselves, not only this morning, but that's a question you guys have to ask yourself daily, daily taking up your cross and following Jesus. I mean, this whole this whole Christ, Christianity, the walk, it's going to be hard. The Bible's clear we are going to suffer. The Bible's clear we are going to sin. But it's, it's, a, it's a marathon. We, we keep going every single day. Every single day it is, is a journey. Is an adventure. It is a beast. It is. Yesterday I went up to um, a park up here, played some basketball with some of, some of the boys that go to some of your schools um, just to try to fellowship, get connected and stuff. And guys, let me tell you something. As much fun as it was, like balling, earning respect and all that stuff, just being around that atmosphere for an hour, hour and a half, I could tell how hard it is, because I know they're your classmates, how hard it is being surrounded by that every day. I understand it's tough in your schools. Like, I get it. Like, I get it. Some of the things that were said, the content of what was said, I get it. So I'm not trying to act like it's an easy walk. Like, you should walk into school and be like, I'm going to produce fruit today, and everything's going to be great, and nobody's going to make fun of me. You can't have that mentality. You can't have that. You can't have that. Um, but at the same time, you are where you are for a reason.